Members of the London Green Party will be soon voting to select their candidate for the 2024 London mayoral election. At the time of recording, three people have put their names forward. First up, Benali Hamdash, who is a councillor in Islington. Zoe Garbutt, who is a councillor in Hackney. And finally, Scott Ainsley, who is a former Green Party MEP and also a councillor in Lambeth. Now, before I introduce the candidate that we have with us today, I have one thing to ask you all to do, which is to scroll down right now and hit that subscribe button. It means that you won't miss out on any of the other videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. So without further, to, further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Scott Ainsley. Scott, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Chris. I had a lovely Christmas. I've been busy working over Christmas. Um, I, I don't know if everyone knows this, but I'm an actor and uh, I've not been able to work for two and a bit years, but uh, I've come on a way to do pantomime. Uh, it means that I can feed my kids. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm still doing that until this Saturday. So uh, it's been fun. It's been good being in front of a live audience again, and people are loving it. And it's such a it's such a leveler, a pantomime, because you get kids to old people all just sharing in a great British tradition. And uh, yeah, it's been really, really good to do it, and uh, pays the blim bills. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure many, many people have enjoyed your appearances in this year's Panto, um, but we're going to be talking politics rather than Panto today. Yeah. And the first question I have for you is, what do you think makes you the best person to be the Greens candidate for London Mayor in 2024? Um, well, uh, like Sean Berry and Caroline Russell, I was elected in 2014, again in 2018, and again in 2022. Uh, with a massive vote, we got 22% which uh, across the borough, which leaves us well placed to win more council seats next time round. And we got a great slate of candidates. Um, I think that when I became uh, London's Green MEP, um, my robust kind of community work that I'd been doing locally, I was able to take that and uh, uh, into the European Parliament and expose corruption and put a spotlight on uh, politicians who are, I would say, compromised, I think, by uh, vested interests uh, and shine a spotlight on them. Uh, often I would relate it as well to um, the, the kind of subjugation of people in my own constituency um, and particularly um, Black and ethnic minorities and everyone that has been suffering um, as a result of, uh, you know, a very unequal society. Um, I think what being an MEP flagged to me as well was that uh, you you had a lot of agency. You could um, take bigger grassroots organisations, which I'm used to working with locally, and really affect policy. So I led um, a cross party. Um, I chaired a cross-party uh, meeting to hold, to veto a trade deal with the EU and India because uh, Modi's nationalistic uh, rhetoric was anti-Muslim. It was, um, you know, it going to be, they, they, they were putting through some sort of citizenship amendment act, which would have disenfranchised uh, 250 million, uh, mainly Muslim uh, and minority people in India so that he could become popular in the polls. Um, and I led those discussions. So um, I think, and being a Lambeth councillor, I mean, I think they, the, Lambeth has been a particularly top down, heavy handed council. It's not brought the community along with it. Um, I think that you know, I work really well with grassroots organizations uh, to get results. And as a result, we've, we've uh, made uh, Lambeth totally rethink its uh, strategy on council housing, um, as well as sh shone a spotlight on the fact that they are um, leaking money out the door on contracts that could be saved to protect frontline services that are badly needed in one of the most unequal uh, parts of London. So I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm well equipped and well uh, positioned and resilient enough to uh, engage a lot of uh, members to uh, elect more Greens next time round. And I think there's a great team standing for the mayoral elections in 2024. 
and the uh, London list. So I think um, I'm looking forward to joining that lot. Um, and because we're the only ones with any ideas, you know, the Greens are the ones with the vision that are not afraid to call things like they are and um, not sit on the fence like Labour's been doing over a lot of the big issues. So I want to talk a little bit now about your vision for London. And I wondered if you could talk through what your vision for London would be. Well, I mean, like other candidates, it's, you know, safer, cleaner, greener um, and fairer. Uh, we, we live in one of the most richest cities on earth, yet we still have children going to school with no food in their bellies. And that is an absolute outrage. Um, I know that assembly members have been trying to force that through, but you know, there's a lot of words and there's a lot of warm words, particularly from Labour on all the big issues that we keep um, forcing them to uh, policies to implement. But until they act, it's all just warm words. So um, I don't understand why, if it's been voted through at the London Assembly, um, look, all local authorities aren't on board with providing uh, free, free school meals, to, for example, to um, primary school children. All primary school children. Um, the the vision that we uh, that, that I have, I guess, um, as London Mayor candidate, is that there's also a lot of greenwash, and it's I, I want a zero tolerance on all the greenwash. So, for example, we've set a target uh, in London to be net zero carbon by 2030, yet we are um, systematically ignoring this um, whole carbon life cycle. Um, uh, of, of buildings. We're destroying concrete buildings. The, the legislation is there, but it's being overlooked. It's not being actively enforced. Um, you know, we should be retrofitting first. We lag well behind cities like Paris and Amsterdam that have set proper, robust targets for getting to net zero in the build environment. I mean, the build environment accounts for 40% of uh, carbon emissions. And the, the frustrating thing about this um, is that the construction industry will just do what they've always done. Business as usual, get away with what they can. But the architects, the, um, the structural engineers, all of these people are on board with a retrofit first campaign. That would really go a long way of, uh, I mean, I sit on the planning committee in Lambeth and I see these planning officers trying to do their best. But um, actually, if developers can get away with it, just by giving a backhander to offset um, the fact that they cannot get to zero carbon over the whole life cycle of a building, that, you know, that's got to stop. It, you know, they're just buying their way out of a problem and, and kicking the can down the road. So I want a zero tolerance on that. But I want a decent and dignified life for all Londoners. One thing that uh, being a Lambeth councillor, um, you know, I've seen communities being ridden roughshod over in terms of their, their council housing. We've talked, forced a total rethink on that because Lambeth were top down. What we need is bottom up policies and I policies. And I believe in unleashing the power of communities. Communities know what works best for them. And it's just a case of, of listening and bringing them along with you. Um, trying to impose thing, things from a top down um, uh, way of operating has not worked well in Croydon, it's not worked well in Lambeth with this kind of quasi private public um, uh, housing uh, uh, entry into the property market that, that Lambeth were trying to do. Um, and now they're, they've, they've, we've forced the total rethink on that. So, um, and we've got to stop people living in damp. Uh, we live in some of the worst badly insulated homes in Europe. You know, all the other parties have had a chance of um, uh, massive opportunities to retrofit homes, to insulate homes properly over the decades. They failed. Give the new guys on the block a chance. Um, and that's what I'd like us to do. So you've talked about a lot of things uh, there, yeah. and I want to, uh, I guess, go into a little bit more detail on some of that. And I want you yeah. to imagine uh, you're in May 2024, and you're sitting in City Hall and you've just been elected as Mayor of London. Uh, what does the first 100 days of a Scott Ainsley mayoralty look like? 
Um, again, like I say, zero tolerance on greenwash. Um, uh, these um, carbon offset payments um, have got to end. They've got to, developers, the construction industry has got to retrofit first. Um, that there would be uh, a whole series of programmed citizens assemblies um, across London on a lot of the big issues that we face, for example, um, airport expansion um, in terms of, you know, uh, the tree canopy, uh, the mature tree canopy. We're, we're again, we're in London, we're cutting down mature trees that um, and replacing them with not with like for like um, carbon sinks that the trees uh, and mature trees are. Um, you know, there's a lot. So I get rid of all the greenwash. I mean, also, we've got to follow the money in terms of um, everyone that's making these carbon offset payments, you know, say they give, I don't know, £250,000 to plant some trees. We've got to make sure that those are not double counted, you know, where, where every part of the construction process says, oh, we've done our bit, because there is so much greenwash out there. And there are so many nice words, but not enough action to back it up. So all that nonsense would stop um, in the first uh, 100 uh, days. And uh, one of the major issues that I'd like to look at is, is housing as well. That's what we focused on in Lambeth. We focused on the environment and on uh, people's housing. And that really is the centerpiece to a dignified life, um, a decent and dignified life for all Londoners. We're not doing that right now. Um, uh, it really is disgusting, the levels of inequality in this city. And it's not good for the very, very rich because they have to build their more walls or more fences around their properties. Well, what's the point of doing that? You, you would live in a cocoon, you know? So I don't think, so it needs the leadership to come from the mayor's office to say, right, okay. Um, London is very unequal. We want to do something about it. And as for um, the fact that, that, that you know, we've lost um, the right to, to hold um, a proportional election, I mean, that's just absolutely unforgivable. You know, they, this, this government has massively overreached its powers um, in terms of policing, in terms of uh, the assault, the major assault on our democracy. And I warned about this as the uh, when I was the Green MEP, that um, you know in this digital age the threat to our democracy is huge, and the vested interests of uh, politicians that are compromised by the fossil fuel lobby or lobbying groups anyway. And I think we need to expose that. You know, um, uh, like I said earlier on, I would have uh, free school meals to, for every single primary school child. Um, I would look to get, uh, get more powers for the London mayor. And I certainly wouldn't be being allowing, um, you know, the government to tell us how we hold our electoral system. I mean, that's just, it's unforgivable. Um, you know, uh, imagine Scotland is a population of uh, 5 million than the Scottish Parliament. Can you imagine if the UK government was to say, right, we're deciding how you're going to hold your elections? They would be up in arms and there would be a massive, even more of a split um, in the country. So, and that's what's happened in London, where we have almost doubled the population. So, you know, um, <laughs> I think we have, to, we have to set the rules in London and not be told by um, national government or not be top trumped by national government. I think that was a massive, um, well, how, how that was allowed to happen, I do not know. Um, uh, there, there'd be a whole lot of other things <laughs> to, to help the most, um, you know, those that are struggling in the cost of living crisis. Um, so in a way you'd be, I'd be looking to level up London. You know, so uh, it's often a misconception that everyone thinks that because money is spent in London and uh, uh, on transport system, et cetera, that uh, London is doing very, very well. But you could throw a stone from a millionaire's flat in Canary Wharf and it would hit the window of some of the poorest people um, living cheek by jowl. You know, that's, that's not a city that any of us want to be living in. And I have to say, not enough has been done about that by the London mayor. 
He can say all the, the nice fancy words in his brochures, but he's not delivering on it. Um, you know, the Greens are the ones that are holding his feet to the fire and getting real change for, for people on the ground. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a long answer to your very short question. Thanks. Well, what I'm going to do now is move on from uh, the post-election scenarios and look a little bit about the election campaign itself. Mm. And in the London mayor election, uh, every political party will be trying to build coalitions of voters uh, in order to get the result that they want to get. And I wondered if you could talk through what your assessment is of what the coalition of voters that the Greens need to pull, pull together is to deliver the result that you want to see. Um, that's a really good question, Chris, and I think that, um, I mean, looking at the results um, uh, the last time round, two and a half million people voted out of six million. Um, Labour got less than a million. I think there's a lot of disaffected uh, Labour voters who, they, you know, they, they, Labour have been fence-sitting for so long, and I'm hoping that a lot of uh, those Labour members, even elected uh, politicians, that are coming over to the Greens are coming because we stand on our progressive principles. And we're not afraid to say that we are, um, you know, uh, pro-EU, that we are um, uh, supporting the unions on, on, on picket lines. Um, you know, Labour is in a very, very uh, tricky place right now. And so there's, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many people are, um, so disappointed and i mean i know anecdotally that so many people are disappointed with the labor leadership right now but um there's an awful lot of fence sitting going on so if we could tap into um those disaffected labor voters that would be good i think the conservative um with their experiment in uh neoliberalism on steroids um is really upsetting not only um people that are sort of in the middle of politics. But I mean, I, I think a lot of conservative voters are going to just think, um, I've had enough of this. This is just this, you know, I have I've conservatives voting for me in my ward because I they know I'm, I'm someone that gets stuff done locally. And I will, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, liberal Democrats voters who have voted for me locally even, and Labour voters who say, please don't tell you know, the council, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be voting for you locally. Um, so I think we've got the policies, we've got the vision, we'll, we could be taking uh, these votes. Um, with regards to the Lib Dem votes, I mean, they got 180, about 190,000 votes last time round. Um, I, I don't know, it seems as though people have got short term memories, haven't they? Because I'm, I'm surprised that uh, they've kept that. And what it suggests to me, and I, and this became quite apparent when I was in the European Parliament, that uh, the Liberals can be all over the place politically. You know, they, they can be quite far right and they can be quite far left, depending on who you're, you're dealing with. Um, and I see them sitting on the fence on an awful lot of issues. If we look at the smaller parties, um, for example, the Women's Equality Party, um, and the rejoin EU almost took 100,000 votes between them. Um, you know, obviously, where, where are those rejoin EU votes going to go? If we could speak to the Women's Equality Party, that would be great. I mean, we, we have a very progressive, um, I think we are a very progressive party, so I don't know why we have not, um, uh, I don't know, had more discussions openly with the Women's Equality Party. Um, animal welfare, again, you know, the Green Party policies on, we, I mean, this is the thing, we have the policies. It's just, are we reaching all of these groups to say, look, we're kind of doing what you, what you want to do. And if you stand on your own platform, you will take some votes, absolutely. But what are your chances of winning the seat? Um, I'm hoping that the UKIP vote or the Brexit vote will, you know, I, mean, I think there's areas where they're going to be strong. Um, and but I, I, I mean, Brexit has really screwed up the capital. It's going to continue to screw up the rest of the country. And I think uh, increasingly the polls are showing that um, uh, 
you know, the business community, uh, the, the hotels, the hospitality industry, all the things that we do well in this capital are all suffering and they're all saying the same thing. And increasingly, uh, the polls are coming out to say that, you know, more and more people are thinking, are waking up to the fact that it was an absolute mistake. It was an absolute con uh, and a travesty of democracy um, to, um, you know, there's, there, there was just so many corrupt politicians fueled by a right-wing press by people who don't even pay tax in this country. The control of the narrative that, um, uh, you know, those parties had in our media um, was just, and, and, you know, I mean, even the chair of the um, Culture, Digital, Media and Sport Committee said that, you know, we just can't, our electoral system is not fit for the digital age. You know, we can't hold, that we can't guarantee that we have fair and free elections. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, who are we it's in the so-called mother of all democracies to go and look at whether they're holding free and fair elections in other countries throughout the world when the chair of the committee that look, is looking into this kept is saying that they can't, um, yeah, they've got no control in the digital age over the electoral system and then the electorate and some of the messages that were going out the, um, from the uh, Brexit campaigners was, was I mean, just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And we, we, need, we, need, we need to ensure that, um, you know, lies cannot be spread like that again. Anyway, so the, I think in answer to your question, there's, there, there's a lot of folks, I think, uh, you know, our, our big issue um, is how do we get across to people that always vote Labour, that they always vote the way that they've always voted because their parents do or because that's the way they've always done. How do we get across that actually we are the ones with the ideas? We are the ones that are um, on the side of all Londoners um, for the benefit of all Londoners. And I think that we need to refocus the language. And I think that our assembly members are doing a great job of that at the moment. Um, you know, saying that the cost of living crisis is tied in with the climate crisis um, and that the solutions to social justice is a racial justice issue, an equalities issue, a diversity and inclusion issue. Um, um, and, we, and we just got to we just got to make sure that our messaging comes across um, to uh, people who are a majority of, of Londoners who are worried about how they're going to put meal, uh, a meal on the table at the end of the day, who are worried about paying the rent or their mortgage um, and feeding their kids. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that most Londoners are worried about. And we've got the policies to um, kind of take care of that. But at the moment, it's just how we reach them in an effective way. Um, what are the channels that we need to look at in order to, to reach um, the voters that we need to reach? So you mentioned lots of different groups of voters there. And for my final serious question, before I move on to my slightly less serious questions that I always finish on, um, I wanted to ask you about one of those groups in particular. And it's yeah. the one you mentioned first, which is disaffected Labour voters. So Bright Green, obviously a huge proportion of our audience is Green Party members, supports the Green Party, but we also have quite a lot of viewers and uh, readers who are either current Labour voters or have previously voted Labour and flirted with the Greens, um, but uh, are not necessarily diehard Greens um, all the time. What one message would you give to a Labour voter in London to convince them to vote Green in 2024? Who are the Labour Party? What do they stand for? Uh, do you want to continue to vote for a party that sits on the fence on the big issues that are affecting your life? You know, they sat on the fence over Brexit. They sat on the fence over these strikes. They've, you know, they, it's almost as if, um, uh, like Tony Blair, Keir Starmer's listening to the focus groups and just thinking, 
or you've got to be authoritarian in order to, uh, you, you know, and, and, and as someone said on Question Time recently, uh, parties don't win elections, other parties lose elections. How sad is that? You know, um, you know, Labour may do well in the next general election, but only because the Tories have done so badly. What do they stand for? Who are they? What value system are they based in? The Green Party has the policies. It has the vision. It has the vision locally. Labour are out of ideas. It has the, uh, they have the, the drive, the work ethic at City Hall. And, uh, you know, if we had 10 Caroline Lucases or 18, if we had a proportional system in this country um, from the last election results, what a difference our parliament would be. And as in uh, when I was an MEP in Europe, the vision, the, the, the uh, drive, the momentum is with the Green Party because they want to create using uh, the climate and ecological crisis as a, as a lens through which to build uh, a safer, fairer um, and greener uh, world to sustain life on planet Earth. They're the ones with the ideas. They're the ones that are accelerating through with some great policies. And um, it's just that we don't take money like, you know, the Lib Dems do from their lobbyists or um, uh, Labour do. I mean, Labour is, is, okay. How can Labour say that they want to uh, combat the climate crisis and then have their conference sponsored, uh, sponsored by Gatwick and Heathrow Airport and be pro-expansion? You know, you've got to choose a side here. Uh, uh, the Labour Party's got to choose a side. And for too long, it's been sitting on the fence. And um, if they do well, they're doing well only because uh, the Conservatives have been done so badly, not because they offer a positive vision for this country or a positive vision for our city. You know, they're just, I, I don't know. Um, so I, I would get on board. I would have a look at the Green, if I was a Labour, uh, if I was a Labour supporter, I'd have a look at Green Party policies and all the things that matter to you and compare them to Labour policy and see, um, see which party actually represents your views or do that thing. I mean, hopefully, do you remember that quiz came out, you know, where are you on this? And then at the end, it would tell you which party you were most suited to. Most people that did that found that they were green. <laughs> so I don't know if that's still going, but um, maybe someone could find a link and, uh, and put that up and maybe Labour voters would move over to the Green Party. So as promised, I'm going to move on to a couple of slightly less serious questions. Uh, the first of which is, what is your favourite London borough? Well, have a guess, Chris. <laughs> Look, um, I, I'm bringing up my children in Lambeth. I mean, that was the first reason I stood, um, was to make my area safer, fairer, cleaner, greener, uh, so that they can grow up in a, in a nice environment. Um, and uh, so Lambeth has been my home for the last 20 years and it's um, got to be my favorite borough. I mean, it's also the most racially integrated. I mean, people all over the world will come and they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, you've got different communities, global communities living cheek by jowl and hanging out in the same clubs in a way that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, really, you know. Um, and I think that's what's unique about it. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, great things about Lambeth. Um, but in saying that, I've lived in, in other boroughs. I've lived in, uh, gosh, Ealing, Harringay, um, uh, Harrow for a while. Um, you know, I've been, I've been, the only place I've not really stayed a lot in is over in East London, but I do have friends there and I love it. And I love the multiculturalism. It's what really makes things thrive. thrive. And also Lambeth was the biggest vote outside the Rock of Gibraltar that voted to remain in the EU. And I'm dead proud of that. And what is your favourite tube line? Um, my favourite tube line, well, to be honest, I cycle everywhere. Um, uh, it's the only exercise <laughs> I really get. Um, so I, and I 
so I don't use the tube a lot, but when I do, I get the Buster Brixton from Streatham and then I get on the Victoria line. And then I'll change to, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, my first introduction to London was the Central Line and I loved that trip out to, to Ealing. It was, it was lovely, but, um, and I've not been on that new Elizabeth Line yet, but um, I hear it's, it's um, remarkable. And the fact that it just goes, yeah, so far it stretches all the way across London out to sort of out towards Essex and stuff like that. It's just, just, just incredible. Um, but I've not been on it. Oh, I also like the overground. So if I can, I'll get to Clapham Junction and then I'll get on that if I'm going up east or to Crystal Palace, get the train from Streatham Hill to Crystal Palace then. So, yeah. Um, oh, dear. I think I've just contradicted myself, haven't I? Ideally, I'd be cycling anyway. There you go. So your favourite tube line is a bike. Perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... What is your favourite London venue? Uh, well, that's changed as I've as, as I've got older. Um, I mean, I uh, I love the Globe Theatre. Um, I I you know I go there quite a bit. And because what I love about that is that um, the uh, audience are lit. I mean, I think when I used to go to the theatre and they would turn the lights down on the audience, that would just make me go to sleep very sometimes whereas the globe is kind of like um so interactive and everyone you can see people's faces and you can react um and you know to the actors and stuff that's really really good i like that i like the tate i, I i'm a member of tate modern uh, well the tate and i like going to the tate modern particularly but i'm inspired by a lot of art as well um, and old art so i go to the tate Britain uh, as if i'm having the a meeting with someone I'll often meet them either at the modern or uh, uh, the Britain uh, T Britain in terms of music venues I regularly can you know, after hours after a council meeting uh, I'll end up going to the Hootenanny for a bit of uh, you know a bit of release <laughs> and a bit of uh, after hours drinking time um, with uh, with some friends so that's that's good I like the Hootenanny. Who is your favourite historical Londoner? Oh gosh, that's that's really difficult because um, there, there are so many. Um, I mean, I, I I don't know if you know this, but I I was I worked with a lot of uh, African reparationists to get the first motion passed on atonement and uh, reparative justice for the transatlantic trafficking of enslaved Africans. Um, so it would, it would be someone like um, uh, someone who was involved in the abolition movement, um, but also. People like Olive Morris, uh, you know, who uh, was a community activist from the grassroots, who um, founded uh, amazing groups uh, for like the Black Workers Group, um, uh, African and Asian Women's Group, um, and also worked with the Brixton Community Law Centre. These grassroots um, uh, organizations that are there to support and there's a fund of an Olive Morris fund as well that will fund young uh, give bursaries to young black women uh, I think that started in 2011 and she was on the one of the Brixton pounds as well as an inspirational uh, community leader who unfortunately sadly died at a very young age but um, a formidable woman um, and yeah so I there's so many people that have passed through London as well you know um, the, yeah, anyway, I, I, that's enough, I think. That's, yeah. And my final question for you, how I always end these, is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Uh, it's not one particular person, really. I mean, I think at different times it has been, um, it's been different people. And, and a lot of the time it's not, it's not the frontliners, you know, it's, it's people that are helping the frontliners. You know, I can think of um, a couple of people that have helped Caroline Lucas over the years, for example. Um, Caroline's wonderful. Uh, you know, our assembly members, I, oh, their work ethic is off the scale, you know. But there's a lot of them off. Well, I did a tour in 2016. I stayed with a lot of Green people, or Green Party members across the country and inspired by, you know, people in um, 
uh, in Oxford, in Norwich. Um, yeah, there's so many people. I, and up north, you know, they, they, there's um, Andrew Cooper, who's done an awful lot as a counsellor for over many, many years, always taking advice. So really, it's it's bits of people all the time. I was I was very proud to follow in Jean Lambert's footsteps. I mean, it was a, a pair of big boots to fill, and I took on the baton for unfortunately only seven months. But um, you know what Jean achieved as well was, in policy terms, was very well regarded by the other Green MEPs. She was a voice that was listened to. Um, yeah. Um, I've got Greens in Europe as well that are totally inspirational. So, you know, there's just bits of everyone all over. The, you know, there's Greens in power that I was lucky enough to, to share some time in office with um, as an MEP who are now in power in their countries and doing great things. So, yeah, a little bit of everyone. I'm sorry I can't be more specific. Not at all. That is totally fine. Uh, let's get us into my questions. Scott, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thanks. Cheers. So before I let all of you leave, uh, I just have a few final things to say. The first of which is if you have enjoyed this interview, then you will enjoy the other videos that Bright Green puts out. The best way to keep on top of all of them is to hit that subscribe button. It means that you'll get a little notification every time we put anything out, uh, including our monthly live show, Bright Green Live. So please do hit that subscribe button. There's probably plenty in the conversation that I've just had with Scott that you agree with. There may well be things that you disagree with. Let us know what you think in the comments down below and keep the conversation conversation going down there. And finally, you may or may not be aware, but Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires and big business. We rely solely on the kind, generous support of people like you. In this video, there is a link in the description to our donate page. If you are able to, please do head there and set up a regular donation so that we can keep putting out videos just like this. So that's all from me. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all very, very soon.